course over the past few years, and you of course know what the agencies are doing and put out publicly, what do you see as some of the big picture issues coming up over the horizon when it comes to post-collection use of intelligence information from your seat at the ACLU? Yeah, I mean, first I kind of want to talk about what's the world that I worry about, right? What's the world that the ACLU worries about? Um, and I think when we think about NSA collection, we worry about a world where there's a whole lot of collection. We're not talking about a dozen or a hundred um, emails or transactions a year, but on the order of millions. And we worry about those databases and that information being used in part for domestic criminal enforcement, right? Not to protect national security, um, not to find information about, you know, a, a upcoming potential terrorist threat but in your everyday normal criminal enforcement, in which case generally police would be required to go to a neutral judge and get a warrant, demonstrating probable cause that someone has actually um, may commit a crime or has been accused of committing a crime. And we worry about all that happening in a world where even if that information was gained and even if it was used in a criminal court, that person doesn't even know. They don't even know enough to say, look, I think the NSA may have collected this and I'd like to challenge it because I think my rights have been violated. So that's the world that we worry about. Um, and I think I want to talk a little bit about why I think that some of the procedures are inadequate and are leading us closer and closer to this world. Um, and I think the first thing I want to highlight is we've been talking a lot about foreign intelligence. You've heard Becky and Sharon say, look, well, we're, we're only keeping the stuff that has foreign intelligence value, or we're only querying things if we think it's going to return foreign intelligence. Foreign intelligence is an incredibly broad term. Um, it could include, let's say, a journalist overseas communicating with a journalist in the U.S. about perhaps a drone program. It could include communications from human rights organizations about foreign policy. Um, it could include information about you know, everyday citizens abroad who are communicating with their families in the U.S. who may talk about issues surrounding foreign affairs. And so first of all, we're dealing with a situation where we're conceptualizing foreign intelligence, I think much broader than the public thinks when they think foreign intelligence, because when they think foreign intelligence, they think stopping terrorist attacks, and that's not what foreign intelligence means in under many of these authorities. The second thing I want to talk about is, okay, well now we have this, this trove of foreign intelligence information, right? And we're going to allow agencies such as the FBI who also have law enforcement authority to run queries on it. They're not just running queries in cases where um, they may want to, you know, again, gather information about an uh, upcoming terrorist plot. They're also running these queries or running queries on databases that include this information in your normal criminal case. Um, we don't know how many times because despite many requests, we don't have a sense of how many of those types of searches are performed. Um, but what we do know from the reports is that it may be substantial because that data is commingled with other databases and if I'm an FBI agent and I'm beginning an investigation, I may do a query um, and that query might involve databases that include foreign intelligence information. And then the third layer that we're seeing increasingly come up is, you know, now I'm worried that not only have you collected the information, you've queried it and you want to use it for, you know, in a criminal case or not, maybe not even a criminal prosecution, maybe to affect something else in my life of, you know, I'm now subject to additional search, or I'm subject to a wiretap, or I don't get an immigration benefit that I've applied to. But just looking at, let's say, criminal prosecution, you know, potentially one of the most damaging out of those three options is we're not seeing people get notice in court of how their information was collected. Um, Section 702, that's one of the, the provisions Becky talked about. Prior to 2013, there was not one defendant who got notice. Now, apparently at some point there was a re-examination um, of DOJ policy, um, and there's been some notice since that, not a lot, but some. We don't know how that notice is being interpreted um, and whether really those provisions that require notice under Section 702 are making sure that everybody who's had information used against them knows that and gets that um, so that they can challenge unconstitutional surveillance. In other contexts, we haven't even seen an acknowledgement from the government that they have an obligation or a duty to provide notice. You know, under Executive Order 12333, if information through the course of that surveillance is ultimately used in a criminal prosecution, we don't know whether the government takes the position that yes, they must disclose that to the defendant who can then challenge it. And, you know, I raise these examples to, I think, demonstrate the increasing evidence that, you know, an authorities that have been developed and have been premised on this idea of 
We need this information to protect our country against terrorist threats or proliferation, and those authorities are increasingly bleeding into everyday general law enforcement activities, and there needs to be more reform to pre prevent against that bleed. Thank you. So as you can see, we have a range